Hello, and welcome to the University of Wisconsin Center for Financial Securities webinar. Today's webinar is the fourth in a series of webinars, and uh, our topic for today is Harnessing Technology to Enhance Financial Literacy Education and Personal Financial Well-Being. Uh, my name is Karen Morell. I'm a consultant with the Center for Financial uh, Security, and we have an exciting uh, uh, program for you today. We're going to hear some uh, new research that's been conducted by Dr. Wendy Way, and then we have two practitioners that are going to respond to her research and really give us the practitioner's uh, point of view and kind of let us know how that research aligns with what's going on in, on the ground. And I think this, uh, this, this topic is very timely because there's been a recent increase in the n number of technology tools that are being used for financial literacy education, but there really has been little attention given to the understanding of why these technologies are expected to enhance the outcomes for uh, uh, consumers that are involved in financial education. So Wendy Way has, has really attempted to fill this gap by examining the behavioral and economic theories that will provide some insight into how these digital pedagogies may support personal finance-related teaching and learning. And she's going to present an ecological model for technology-based financial literacy uh, interventions and an action agenda for practice and further research. And as I mentioned, we have Nick Maynard uh, and Bruce Fates, who are going to be uh, serving as discussants. And I will give a, a more full introduction for each of our participants in just a minute. But let me first just go through some quick housekeeping remarks, and then we'll, we'll quickly move to Wendy's presentation. But just so you know, we're going to have a presentation from Wendy first, and she'll spend about 20 minutes sharing uh, her findings from her, her paper that's been recently published. And then we will have a seven-minute pr presentation from each of our discussions, discussions, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So the way that this will work is all of the participants are muted, but you can um, submit questions at any time during the presentation by accessing the uh, the little bubble that's on your website. It's the second icon above the screen. And if you just double-click on that, you can type in questions. We'll respond to those um, at the end during the question and the answer period. And if there are questions that we can't get to, we will respond to those on, on the CFS website, the Center for Financial Security website after the webinar. So uh, last housekeeping thing, if uh, there are any technology issues that come up while you are on the webinar and you can't resolve them on your own, we do have an IT help desk that you can contact. Um, the number for the IT help desk is 800-442-4614. Again, that's 800-442-4614. And with that, I think we will move straight into the presentation. So. Let me just give a little bit of uh, background information about Wendy Way. She is a professor and associate dean of the undergraduate and graduate academic programs in the School of Human Ecology. She's also a professor within the Department of Econo Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. Uh, her research focuses on enhancing economic opportunities and the economic well-being of both youth and adults through education. And she's been focused on a, a number of initiatives that, that focus specifically on teaching financial education. And uh, some of these uh, initiatives have included assessing teachers' preparedness to teach financial education. And then also what we're going to talk about today is examining how to harness the potential of technology to build financial capability. Um, Dr. Way has served as editor of both the Family and Consumer Sciences Research Journal and the Journal of Vocational Educational Education Research. And she's been a member of the Wisconsin Superintendent of Public Instruction Task Forces on Financial Literacy Education and Entrepreneurship. So with that, I'm going to pause and um, turn it over to Wendy because I don't want to spend any more time on housekeeping. Let's get straight to the presentation. So, Wendy, I'll turn to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Karen, and good afternoon. The project I'm going to be discussing this afternoon is uh, actually a literature review that we conducted recently at UW-Madison uh, Center for Financial Security here to get a better handle on how we can use technology to enhance financial literacy education efforts and promote financial well-being. Um, I was fortunate to have the assistance of graduate student Ling C. Ang and also da uh, Dr. Nancy Wong um, uh, during the course of this project, and I'd like to acknowledge their contributions. Um, the research was funded by the Social Security Administration as one of a series of recent UW-Madison uh, Financial Literacy Research Consortium projects, and uh, I'm sure the Social Security Administration would be happy to have me note that the work is solely that of the project personnel and does not reflect the views of the Social Security Administration or the federal government. 
So in terms of the motivation for the project, um, it stemmed generally from the growing interest um, that there's been nationally in personal finance education and the common presumption that it will lead to improved financial behavior and financial well-being. But for me, more specifically, it stemmed from a project that Karen referred to um, earlier in the introduction that Dr. Karen Holden and I uh, conducted in 2009-10 on teachers' preparedness to teach financial literacy education. That study, which was funded by the National Endowment for Financial Education, revealed that teachers felt largely unprepared uh, to use, uh, well, they, they felt largely unprepared in both subject matter and pedagogy uh, to teach financial literacy education, but they felt particularly unprepared to make use of online teaching and learning resources. And as we thought about those findings, we thought, well, this is not really surprising because while there's been um, a, an explosion in recent years in, a ten in the number of technology-based tools that are available, there's been a little attention given to why these tools and resources would be expected to improve financial literacy education outcomes or financial well-being uh, for learners in general or specific population groups. And so it seemed there was a need for some theory-based guidance here, and, and that's why we launched this project. So we set out to identify perspectives from the literature that might be helpful. Um, to start, we wanted to identify the kinds of technology-based resources that are available to support personal finance education. And since a primary goal of financial education is to um, enable individuals to act in ways that will lead to financial well-being, one of our purposes was to review th theories of human behavior. And another was to examine what the literature said about how technology might support teaching and learning. And then finally, um, we hope to develop a theoretically grounded model that could be used to inform both research and practice in this area. In our scan of technology-based tools and resources, we identified five categories or types of resources that are now available. And um, the slide that is showing right now um, shows the first four of these categories. One is website, websites that are devoted primarily to providing financial information. And this would include websites like the excellentmymoney.gov, which is the collection of um, financial information tools and resources that are available through government agencies, um, targeted by groups, group and life events. Federalreserveeducation.org would be another example that falls into this category. And then uh, forums and blogs are two additional types of resources. Um, that are basically social media that permit people to post user-generated content and have online discussions about topics like personal finance. Uh, forums are like message or discussion boards and allow anyone to initiate a discussion, while blogs are more like online journals that allow an individual or group to post pieces of information on which others can comment. Um, both forums and blogs may host ads also through um, such services as Google AdSense, which is a free service that generates uh, revenue for the website initiators and makes for some interesting contrast between the kinds of things that are being discussed about personal finance and the nature of the ads that are posted on the websites. Um, the fourth category, financial management tools, would include uh, things like Mint.com, which is a free service that provides tracking of expenditures and makes recommendations, including recommendations for financial services uh, that are affiliated with, um, with the company, or Envelopes, which is a fee-based, similar service, but fee-based. Um, and then another growing category of resources is online games. And the slide that is showing here displays a list of seven games that were identified as tops in a cbsmoneywatch.com article that appeared last September. Um, no information was given about the criteria that was, was used to designate these games as tops or outstanding. Um, you can see that these uh, games are being distributed by a variety of kinds of organizations, including financial corporations like Visa, um, and indirect government agencies such as the U.S. Treasury, nonprofit groups such as the Jumpstart Coalition doorways to, and Doorways to Dreams. Um, the entertainment industry is also getting into the act. You'll see Disney here. The Great Piggy Bank, Bank Adventure actually um, mirrors an experiential exhibit of the same name uh, that, was, um, that was launched at Epcot Center in Florida in 2009. And then there are many others um, that aren't listed here, of course, like the stock market game by the Foundation for Investor Education and Escape from Canabe, uh developed by U.S. US Bank. So how to choose? 
Um, we discovered that there are numerous theoretical frameworks that might inform decisions about which tools to use and or how to develop um, future such tools, both in terms of what motivates people to behave in specific ways as well as um, what facilitates effective teaching and learning. Um, these frameworks actually provide insights on factors that influence behavior at the individual, the interpersonal, the community organization, and the system or policy levels and can be organized in um, what might be thought of as an ecological uh, kind of framework. We also found that many of the frameworks are complementary and actually suggest that it might be wise or helpful to employ more than one type of strategy at a time. So to summarize the, these ideas, we develop what we've termed an ecological model for technology-based financial education intervention, which is shown on this slide. And it suggests that um, educational intervention should be designed considering three things. One, what we know about theories of human behavior. Two, what educational theory has to offer about how technology can enhance access to education, provide learner support for education, and motivate learning. And then three, take into account what we know about the nature of learners, such as their characteristics, their prior knowledge and skills, financial trigger events, and learning context. The model uh, is meant to point out that educational in in interventions are, of course, only one potential determinant of behavior, and that all educational interventions will be situated within broader philosophical and ideological environments, which frame and perhaps even constrain how we conceive of such things as financial education, financial well-being, financial capacity, etc. So there isn't time today to review in detail each of the behavior theories that we discuss in the paper, but that's being made available um, through the Center for Financial Security. So I'm just going to mention a few of them here in the next um, few slides. And it's important to emphasize that even the frameworks that we identified in the paper um, shouldn't be considered an exhaustive list. There actually are a lot of them out there. Um, so um, what we've done in the paper is we've selected two frameworks at each of the four levels of possible intervention, the individual, the interpersonal, the community slash group, and the system organization um, level. And I'm just going to mention a few of them here. At the individual, um, to explain behavior at the individual level, one framework is the theory of reasoned action, which was developed by Fish, Fishbein and Oshin and uh, colleagues and was later extended by that group to um, include the theory of planned behavior and the integrated behavior model. These theories posit that intention is a key determinant of behavior and that a number of factors other than just knowledge and skills, those two, form the basis of intention and include such things as those that are listed on this slide beliefs about the li likely outcomes of the behavior and how close others would feel about it, the salience of the behavior to the individual, um, one's confidence and ability to perform the behavior despite any barriers that there might be, and experience in performing the behavior. Another model that would fall into this category that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is James Prochaska's uh, theory, uh, trans-theoretical model of change, which su suggests that change doesn't happen just on a dime, but rather is a series of events over time. The trans theoretical um, uh, or the theory of reasoned action suggests that technology based tools that address beliefs build confidence and provide experience in financial matters as well as help build knowledge and skills will be helpful in nurturing positive financial behavior. Interpersonal theories of behavior, which are discussed on this slide, focus on the interaction of the individual and their social environments, and specifically the influence of social relationships or networks on behavior, and these can be either positive or negative. Um, such groups might include family, peers, or online networks. Um, social capital theory is one such theory that falls into this category. Uh, those proposed by James Coleman, Pierre Bordeaux, and Robert Putnam, for example, posit that people gain non-economic rewards through their social relationships, which can be turned into um, uh, economic rewards. Um, such things as access to information, um, reciprocal relationships, and knowledge of norms for behavior. Um, uh, social uh, support frameworks are another category that falls into this category. House, for example, posited that there are a variety of kinds of social support that people get 
uh, through their social networks that help initiate and maintain behavior, such things as emotional support, instrumental support, um, informational support, and appraisal, appraisal support. And there are an increasing number of online options for linking with networks that can provide positive social support for financial, um, related to financial matters. For example, um, my Kmart, many of these are commercial, such as mykmart.com uh, has forums for uh, individuals to uh, connect. Dailyworth.com or wisebread.com, which are collections of blogs, also provide opportunities for people to connect. And what we found is that there are also opportunities to connect in forums in websites that aren't primarily devoted to personal finance matters, such as absolutepunk.net, which is um, for people who are interested in coming together around um, punk rock music. At the uh, community organization level, one of the frameworks we identified was diffusion of innovations theory, which may help explain what makes strategies such as savings campaigns successful and what causes information to go viral on the Internet. The America Saves campaign is an example of a program that actually reflects many of the tenets of diffusion of innovations theory, um, whether or not it was developed explicitly with that in mind. It's a national campaign uh, involving over a thousand nonprofit, corporate, and government groups managed by the Consumer Federation of America. And uh, the idea is to engage groups, organizations, and coalitions in developing and implementing strategies to encourage saving at the community level. And then at the systems policy level, we looked at um, social marketing as a framework, which is applying marketing principles to influence behavior for the benefits of individuals and society, and choice architecture, which comes out of the field of behavioral economics, um, uh, along the lines of uh, the work of Dan Ariely, who wrote Predictably Irrational, and Thaler and Sunstein, who wrote Nudge in 2008. An example here would be encouraging employers to make voluntary retirement savings plans an opt-out rather than an opt-in uh, feature or option at the time of employment to take advantage of individuals' tendency toward um, inertia. As these strategies are not mutually exclusive and, in fact, can be quite complementary, um, it suggests that the, the, the literature suggests that it might be beneficial to apply them simultaneously. And there are a number of scholars in the field of health for example, that suggests that just such an approach is what has been responsible for um, the decline in smoking cessation that's been achieved in the United States in recent years. So when we were looking for clues about how to best harness the power of technology um, for teaching financial education, we also reviewed the literature on how technology might affect access to personal finance education and motivation to learn. And this slide um, describes just a couple of the findings we found there. We found that technology has the potential to enhance access by providing flexibility in how, when, and where learning occurs. This is sometimes referred to as mode, pace, and place of learning. And we also found that technology might go a long way to supporting motivation to learn or not, um, depending on the degree to which it can provide a sense of competence, autonomy, and belongingness along the lines of self-determination theory, as well as flow or immersion and fun. Um, I thought I'd just mention here that some of you may be familiar with the massively multi multiple uh, multiplayer online game World of Warcraft. It now has 13 million subscribers worldwide, which really speaks to the power of games. Uh, and also, there's recent research in the U.S. that indicates that almost a half of parents now play video games on a regular basis with their children. So this is potentially uh, a growth area for expanding personal finance education, perhaps intergenerationally. In terms of um, learning tasks and processes, one of the things that the literature um, clearly pointed out is the, an important distinction between thinking about technology as something that um, one can learn from or promote learning from versus learning with technology. The learning with technology perspective is consistent with constructivist learning theories and human behavior theories. And what this is um, suggests is that um, learning is not just simply transfer of information. It suggests that knowledge or um, understanding is continually refined and um, approaches to learning that nurture or that are consistent with a learning with perspective are characterized by learning activities that are more authentic, less formal, that involve others, provide for reflection and give learners control. And games and simulations offer special potential for 
for um, developing financial management expertise by not only requiring important knowledge and skills, but nurturing situated understanding, experimenting with powerful identities, and developing shared values. One of the other things that we address briefly in the paper is um, the relationship between access to technology and uh, one's financial vulnerability, and concluded that the, the literature shows clearly, points clearly to the idea that lack of access to technology may create or reinforce financial vulnerability um, just because of the, the rapidity of change in the nature of financial services and products, but also um, because of the increased need for lifelong learning. But um, we point out in the paper that access is not just, doesn't just mean having access to the appropriate hardware, although this is a concern, particularly for some low-income groups and people in rural areas, for example, but also the capacity to make meaningful use of it. And that means um, we need to give more attention to knowing, helping learners know how to define information needs and identify and evaluate Internet-based financial information. Um, it also, having access to learning opportunities also points to the importance of having, uh, selecting and designing tools that support diverse learning needs, um, such as age, gender, life cycle stage, language and literacy differences, cultural background, learning styles, and web accessibility for those who may have uh, disabilities. Also, one of the things that the literature points very clearly to is the importance of um, providing learners encouragement for and support for informal or self-directed and not just educated director directed learning. A research by Livingston in Canada, for example, showed that adults engage in five times more self-directed learning activities during adulthood than they do educated directed um, learning and related to personal finance matters. And then also it's important that personal finance educators understand technology and its potential. So just to summarize up uh, quickly here, I think my time is fast disappearing. We did identify a number of um, recommendations for practice and for further research, and I'll just briefly highlight these. Um, um, one, of course, is to um, select technology that nurtures positive financial behavior and not just knowledge acquisition along the lines of, along the, lines of the theory that, that I've just reviewed. Uh, target beliefs as well as knowledge, address potential barriers, and provide some actual practice in the behaviors that we're trying to nurture. Use a learning with approach that fosters reflection and links to action. Uh, use tools that engage, nurture competence and autonomy. Consider the potential for self-directed as well as educated directed learning and designing resources and strategies. And really importantly, um, think about technology as a tool for designing and implementing educational interventions beyond those that just target individuals, that build supportive networks um, through such things as forums and blogs, Facebook even, that spread innovations and that market powerful ideas. And then also to really consider the theory uh, when designing and evaluating technology-based tools using a Y perspective focused on learning and behavior. This slide um, identifies a, a number of questions that um, just basically put um, the ideas that have just been reviewed into a question form that could be used as kind of a, a quick cheat sheet for evaluating resources and whether um, a, a decision is to be made to use this one or that one or a combination of a technology-based resource and some other kind of a resource. I'm not going to review those because um, they're, um, they basically just summarize in addition to the model that we developed what we've just been talking about. We did identify a couple of recommendations for further research. Um, one is that um, it's, it's, I think there's, the literature points to what a great need there is to expand testing of the growing body of personal finance tools, resources, and strategies with diverse audiences in a variety of contexts but doing so from a theoretically grounded perspective. In other words, um, not just testing whether or not something is going to link to a particular behavior, but trying to figure out why we might expect that link. What is it about the resource that might promote or lead us to expect that, that it would be a link to um, particular kinds of um, learning outcomes or behaviors? And um, also perhaps creating a what works clearinghouse of theory and research-based evidence about personal finance education tools, resources, and strategies. 
Um, another big area that I think um, really needs more attention is looking at how social media, which are just exploding, um, are contributing to self-directed and incidental learning about financial matters, since that really is the major way that adults learn throughout the course of the lifespan once they finish their formal education. And then finally, to examine how educators are using and learning to use technology-based financial education tools and strategies. And um, I know we're going to have a little time for Q&A, so I would really be interested in any further suggestions that people have about um, other research topics that we ought to be pursuing um, in the field. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Wendy, and I'll, I'll just uh, take your last comment as an opportunity to invite people, if they, if they do have um, suggestions for you, to, to use that chat function and just type in if there's other areas for research, uh, further research, to please share that with us. So, again, just use that chat function and uh, send us your comments, send us your questions. So, um, at this point, well, first let me just do two, uh, one other housekeeping thing. I've gotten a number of questions about uh, Wendy's, about these uh, slides and Wendy's paper. Um, by the end of today, the day today, you'll be able to go to the Center for Financial Security's website and download the slides. Her paper is there as well, so for folks that are interested in, in having hard copies, you'll just go to that website and you'll, you'll be able to get the paper and the slides, and uh, in a, within a week we'll actually have the archived webinar there as well. Um, at this point, we're going to transition and, and, and uh, have uh, some feedback from the practitioners who were actually on the ground using technology to help people uh, improve their financial capability. And our first discussant is Nick Maynard. He's the Director of Innovation for Doorways to Dreams Fund, which is also known as D2D. And uh, in that capacity, Nick leads the Financial Entertainment Initiative of D2D, and they explore the use of digital media like casual video games to improve financial literacy and financial decision-making for lower-income in lower Americans. Um, since Nick has joined D2D, he's led a number of different initiatives, including a, piloting a prize-length savings uh, a program in the credit union industry. He's also tested cutting-edge marketing innovations for small savers and offering the U.S. savings bonds at tax time. And then he's offered, authored a number of papers, including he was the lead author on the Filing Research Institution publication, Does Imagery Matter? Delving into the Mind of Low to Moderate Income Savers. And he was a co-author on the Harvard Business School working paper, Consumer Demand for Prize Link Savings, a study of Centric Credit Union's Prize Link Savings product launch. So with that, I'm going to turn to Nick, and he's going to share his thoughts and insights about what he's seen with financial uh, literacy and, and the power of using technology to enhance financial literacy. Great. Thanks so much, Karen. And um, if we could move to slide 25 in the deck. Um, everyone, I uh, just wanted to give you an, a quick overview, and I'm going to use some of Wendy's um, framework to, to do that. But I wanted to let you know about financial entertainment, and you can go check that out at financialentertainment.org. Uh, we have five games available uh, for play. If you want to play those right now, I won't be offended in any way, shape, or form. But uh, just talking through briefly, because my time is limited, I want to talk about each of Wendy's questions on slide 20 and take you through how we think about financial entertainment. And really what we're doing, if you look at her first question, um, in terms of the intervention, supporting behavior-focused intervention, what we want to do is impact uh, financial capability. So we're working with an end-user audience of financially vulnerable adults. We know that they are challenged in terms of the resources they have available. And so we want to build games that will improve particular outcomes. Which outcomes? Well, we want to see an increase in savings. We want to see a reduction in debt. We want to see uh, lower fees, uh, potentially errors. And we'd like to see an increase in retirement savings. And so with each of the games that you have the opportunity to play, you'll find that the focus, uh, the targeted uh, lessons and simulations are really built uh, to impact those types of behaviors. Now, if you look at question two, um, does the resource enhance access to learning via flexibility, place, pace, mode of instruction? Financial entertainment is definitely built to maximize uh, flexibility. If, if a player wants to play our award-winning farm blitz at 3 in the morning, then she can do that. Uh, most of the games are also untimed, and they allow the player to move at their own pace. 
They are uh, available in Adobe Flash. Um, from a technology standpoint, that allows them you know, to be very widely accessible by computers online. But we're also exploring the expansion onto Facebook and to mobile, which these types of casual games allow for quite easily and relatively inexpensively. And in early July, we'll launch the first ever casual iPlatform financial literacy game uh, based off Celebrity Calamity. But in addition to that technological flexibility, we also have found um, channel partner flexibility. And so we've piloted uh, with the military, with community colleges, with financial services firms, with employers, community organizations, government agencies. And through all of these distribution pilots, we have found high rates of play among financially vulnerable Americans and, most interestingly, female players. And, and a lot of um, uh, financially vulnerable households are uh, headed by uh, females. Uh, but most interestingly, since we launched the portal in April 2010, we've generated over 180,000 visits, uh, and the average time on task is 26 minutes. And so we, we really believe this innovation and delivery of financial education is creating demand uh, for something that most folks uh, may not feel like they want to go do uh, on an ongoing basis. And that gets to question three about enhancing motivation by a competence, autonomy, belongingness, immersion, fun. Clearly, if you play our games, we try to lead with a lot of what we call chocolate on the broccoli. And so we, we try to build an immersive, fun um, experience. Um, and why did we do that? Well, the ZMET research that, that Karen mentioned that we work on um, really uh, found that, and probably not surprisingly to many, that financially vulnerable head of households are ex extremely stressed about personal finances, and there's a tremendous amount of anxiety. And so one way to reframe financial education and dealing with that financial stress is to put a game around it. And so instead of saying, eat your broccoli, we're saying, hey, have some chocolate. And within that chocolate is a lot of uh, good uh, knowledge and ability to, to impact behavior change. But most Im important, um, we focused early on on building self-efficacy uh, and that sense of competence uh, in being able to make choices that are reflective of real-world choices, uh, credit card decisions, savings decisions, uh, retirement decisions. Uh, but in addition, those choices are made autonomously. Each player uh, plays the game by themselves and has the ability uh, to do that. I think to date the one, one area that we haven't done a good job of is maybe building a sense of belongingness uh, across all players in our community. In terms of question four, reflect learning with perspective, learner control, involvement with others, practice and reflection. You know, each, each of our games puts the learner right in the driver's seat. Um, and so it, it really does allow that learner to practice real-world choices. In Bike Club, uh, you have to decide about 401k uh, contributions. Uh, in, uh, in Celebrity Calamity, you have to make uh, credit card payment decisions. These choices look exactly like the choices that potential uh, consumers face uh, in the real world. Uh, now, while, while financial entertainment has limited formal space um, for reflection, each game <laughs> has a built-in helper character that enhances reflection and feedback in-game. So while there isn't a, the, a formal space, we believe there's a lot of informal and in-game uh, reflection going on uh, through, by players. But, uh, but most interesting to us in terms of this, this approach is the amount of practice players get. They're actually having the ability to practice real-world decisions. And so we took that to the, to the next level um, and building off of some of our research, we, we did a randomized study with 200 low-income folks in Boston. Uh, we took 100 and had them play Farm Blitz, our award-winning game, and we had 100 uh, read online content about uh, interest compounding, saving, debt, uh, and so forth. And uh, as a su surprise to us, uh, among the group that played the game, there was a 4% take-up of buying a U.S. savings bond immediately after playing the game for 30 to 45 minutes, uh, as opposed to the group that read online content material that you would find generally anywhere, um, it was only a 1% take-up. So we're very uh, excited about that randomized experiment and the, and the results that it shows uh, in that direction. Now, in terms of fostering financial expertise, uh, number five, um, what types of skills and patterns of reasoning, values, and personal identities, you know, that continues to show through our, our testing, um, the, the test that I just mentioned, but also all of our games have been tested relating to knowledge and self-confidence pre and post. And we see that goal of reaching self-efficacy that I talked about um, has been achieved in every game that we um, put out into um, financialentertainment.org. In terms of number six, and I think this is part of the secret sauce and one of the most important things to what we do, 
addressing needs of learners, we actually make our games with low income adult females, 18 to 35. The audience is an integral part of the design and development process. We uh, get to know the, the real world choices they make. They reflect on the game motifs. Um, then we make sure the play progression matches the abilities and needs of our audience. And so the underlying game algorithm, the guidelines and rules uh, that are set out in play, um, really do uh, get fully informed by that audience. And so, uh, you know, while, while we're also, you know, reaching that market, the, another very interesting thing for us is we get organic play uh, from the under-18 market across the country, which we don't actually specifically go after. That speaks to a different point, which is the value of casual gaming um, for broad reach. And then finally, uh, to wrap up, question seven, supporting self-directed learning. Financial entertainment is really built uh, for the individual to learn whenever he or she would like, and the game pace is dictated by the player. So we, we do provide on the site resource links for players who want to learn more about a financial topic, who want to take further action. Um, and in addition, D2D is working with partners to further embed action-taking into games at key moments during play. We've got a partnership in place with a large retirement services firm and a large employer to link gameplay to action-taking in Bike Club around 401k deferral rates and participation for uh, low-income uh, workers. So we're really excited about the future, and uh, I think Wendy's paper really puts push forward a good uh, approach for thinking about resources like financial entertainment. That's all I got. Okay, great. Nick, I had you on mute for a second. Thank you, Nick. Uh, that was a really helpful presentation about, you know, what we know about how games are being used as an effective tool. And we have another discussant that's going to share um, a, a, a similar perspective about how games are used in financial education, and that's Bruce Spate. He's the Associate Director of Investor Education at FINRA. And FINRA is the largest independent regulator for all securities firms doing business in the United States. And in that capacity, uh, Bruce leads all the technology pro projects for both um, FINRA Investor Education and the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. So some of the projects that he's launched include Moneytopia, which is an immersion simulation game teaching financial management to young adults. He's also launched the FINRA Fund Analyzer, which is a sophisticated mutual fund, exchange-traded funds, expense analyzer. He's also created the Professional Designations Database, which is an online resource for checking the certifications used by investment professionals. And he's also developed a wide a variety of other interactive tools. Uh, and he's currently leading a project to provide free credit scores to in-need active duty service members worldwide. So with that, I'm going to turn it to you, Bruce. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, as If we can just jump uh, right on to the About Us slide. Uh, I just wanted to uh, briefly talk for a moment about the uh, the mission of the financial uh, FINRA Investor Education Foundation, which is to provide underserved Americans with the knowledge, skills, and tools necessary for financial success throughout life. Um, if you uh, have questions about the foundation, I'd encourage you to go out to our website, FINRAfoundation.org. The foundation has um, uh, approved approximately $50 million worth of investor education and protection initiatives uh, through a combination of grants and targeted programs uh, since we launched in 2003. One of our um, primary programs is our Military Financial Education Project, which provides free, unbiased financial education and tools to service members and their spouses worldwide. Um, can we go to the next slide? And um, when we started in 2003, we wanted to kind of baseline our experience and get an idea of what the financial education needs of the service members were. Um, and to do that, we conducted uh, some uh, research uh, and uh, reached out to service members around the world to uh, not only kind of quiz them on their financial capability, but also ask questions about how they felt about it. And um, as you can see from uh, the slide, the results for individuals under 29 years of age, which is a key demographic for the foundation to reach out to, um, were uh, really uh, indicative of a significant need to provide financial education. 37% um, indicated they weren't knowledgeable at all about financial literacy, and um, the passing rate for the market knowledge test that was part of the study was actually only 11% for that group. So based on those survey results, we looked um, very carefully at the available technology and methodologies at the time and decided to focus on a very holistic approach 
um, to providing immersive simulation uh, yeah, to provide financial education to this uh, audience. So let's go to the next slide if we could. So why would you pick an immersive uh, game simulation? Now, there's, um, there's over 90 million gamers in the U.S. who are 15 to 35, and actually this number is a little bit low. I think that number is probably more like uh, about 120 million now. If you look at the whole population of people that play games in the U.S., it's about 60% of the population at this point. So it's a very appealing, very growing um, method for reaching into that audience. It's a great way to provide real-world experiences with actual consequences in the game, and it lets people work on it in a safe environment so they can experiment and learn. Next slide. Um, when would you choose an immersive simulation? And this can apply to any sort of technology that you might develop, whether it's a, the sort of the more casual game that um, uh, the D2D folks have done or a more comprehensive one like Monitopia. Um, immersive simulation is great for understanding big ideas and concepts. It lets people examine how their decisions and finances impact their life over the course of 5, 10, 20, 30 years because it gives you the ability to accelerate time and scale and let people sort of play out the decisions that they may make. Um, it's great for situations when people need practice making decisions and seeing what the outcome of those decisions are. But they can do it in a safe way that um, isn't really impacting their their actual finances. It's a it's a terrific way for people to um, see how different financial decisions, how managing their checking or savings account, credit cards, etc., can really make a difference in their life. Next slide. So um, I can't show you the game here, but I just wanted to throw up a slide of uh, one of the screens from the game and encourage everyone to go out to our website and uh, you can. Take a look at about a three-minute uh, game demonstration video um, that will give you a much better idea of what the game is about. But basically, it's an accelerated game of life where you make some decisions earlier on about how you want to live, and uh, then you start out, and from that point, life happens. So let's, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the game uses a number of different instructional features uh, it's very learner-centric. We have 12 different avatars that the person can choose from, and they can customize these avatars in different ways. And uh, importantly, you can pick four different uh, friends here within the avatars to compete against. Some will do better than you. Some will do worse. You can actually ask them for advice through the game when you're confronted with financial decisions. Some will give good advice and some will not, uh, much like you know real life. Um, but it's uh, it's a very easy way for the user to kind of customize who they're playing as within the game. Next slide. We use um, decision-oriented approach, uh, a decision-oriented approach within the game to um, confront the user with different kinds of problem-based life events. So that can be everything from as simple as, you know, your car is broken down or your kid wants to join the football team or whatever, but there are hundreds of different events in this game which are randomized within four different life stages. So as the user ages through the accelerated lifetime of the game, the kinds of events and problems they're confronted with will change. When you're very young, the problems are different than when you're older and you get married, you have children, you have to pay for college, different things like that. Um, there are also um, events that come up that are related to retirement and other issues farther into the game. Next slide. Uh, we use some prescriptive learning techniques within the game. So there is a mentor that the user can actually go to their office within the game and receive counseling. Uh, they get a customized report of how they're performing and what they need to focus on. And the uh, counselor can refer them to a number of different case studies. Um, now, these case studies are actually 16 different tutorials that cover a huge range of financial education topics from developing a spending plan, budgeting, planning for retirement, investing, all sorts of stuff. And the user can work through these instructional uh, tutorials, which are part of the game. Within the tutorials themselves, there are um, embedded games that allow the person to kind of test their skill at that point. Uh, next slide. 
Um, there's uh, intrinsic feedback built in as well. So the decisions that you make within the game lead to real consequences. It's very easy to make poor decisions, and as you can see from the slide, Repo Man will come and take your stuff. Um, and it, you can discover how fast that can occur um, simply by letting your credit card uh, or other spending get out of control. Next slide. Uh, we have a number of different features within the game. Um, there are micro games built in to try and help keep it engaging. We have a financial dashboard to um, help the user manage their finances through the game. And uh, also a dream machine where you can come in and kind of configure what your life is going to look like, how you want to live, where you want to live, what kind of car you're going to drive. All of those huge number of decisions that you make every day that have a direct impact on your financial well-being. Next slide. So a little feedback um, about how Moneytopia has been received. Um, and the important stat here is that 60% of the people that play the game have indicated that they will take real steps to change their finances based on their experience playing. And we think this is really important because it shows the connection of performance in a simulated world where the user can experiment and see different outcomes to their actual uh, management of their personal finance. Next slide. Uh, a little a little feedback that um, you can read uh, on your own here. Um, I will mention that um, we find a, a very wide array of users play the game. It was originally built and targeted at 18 to 24-year-old service members, but it was constructed in a way that allowed really a very wide audience to play the game and enjoy it. Um, and we find that um, a lot of uh, parents wind up playing it with their children, which is a very interesting experience for both of them. And uh, we uh, have also seen that it's uh, getting good traction in classroom settings and other kind of client counseling settings as well. Next slide. I wanted to take um, just a, a few seconds here to point everyone to um, another website that we have, which is the Financial Capability Study. This is an updated study. Uh, from where we started, um, which covers all states, and it allows you to um, drill up and down within the data across different dimensions. It's very interesting to see how your state performs, and you can also take a quiz to compare your financial capability against state and national performance. It's a great resource. You can download the data and do further analysis on it. I would encourage folks to go and take a look at it. Uh, and the next slide. So finally, um, Moneytopia is absolutely free. I would encourage everyone to uh, go give it a try. It's a lot of fun to play. You can play for a few minutes before you lose if you make really bad decisions, or you can um, manage your money really carefully and get all the way to your big dream and your retirement. It's a very engaging game, very comprehensive approach compared to uh, the more casual uh, approaches that D2D has done. But I think, as you can see, between the two approaches, both uh, the D2D games and the Moneytopia game can get at some of the basic theories that Dr. Wei has talked about and, and help to answer some of the questions that uh, users need uh, to perform better. Uh, with that, Karen, I'll toss it back to you. Great. Well, we've got a number of questions in the queue, so I'm just going to jump right in. And one question that was related to your last remarks, Bruce, was the fact that Moneytopia is free. I have a question here um, from someone that was interested in sharing these resources about financial uh, literacy on their website. So could they, do they need to go through any process to get approval to you from, from you, uh, Nick, or you, Bruce, or can they just promote those resources? Uh, well, speaking for Moneytopia, um, Moneytopia is absolutely free to everyone. There's no cost or registration required at all. If you go to the URL, um, saveandinvest.org slash Moneytopia, you can play the game, you can view the preview movie I mentioned, and you can also um, use any of those 16 tutorials or case studies independently from the game. So if you just want to um, spend a few minutes talking about developing a spending plan with someone, you can just go right to that, and those only take a few minutes to do. So there's a great number of resources available there. Nick, uh, what about yours? And, and uh, financialentertainment.org is, uh, is out there and free and available to, to anyone who wants to um, have access to it. If you'd like to partner with us and do advertising on your site, uh, uh, shoot me an email at D2D and we can talk about um, the logistics there. It depends on the type of organization you are and, 
and how you want to advertise it, given uh, that we're a small nonprofit. But um, be happy to talk further about that. But uh, as of you know, all the games are available and uh, and quite addictive. So enjoy. Um, one more question about games. Um, do any of the games that were mentioned today, do they take into account the fact that some people acquire disability and may need to address life with disability benefits and programs? Is that, is that addressed at all in any of the games that either you all have talked about or that you know of? So in terms of the library of games, the financial entertainment is, has uh, in the queue um, beyond the five that are out there now. Um, there's uh, the, the broad brush issues, the core issues, uh, don't tie to that specific need. Um, I don't know about uh, any resource out there that ties to that particular um, uh, item in a game type setting. I don't know. Uh, Bruce, does, does Moneytopia cover that? Well, I, I mean, not as a topic per se. There are events and um, issues that can come up in a game where you might be temporarily disabled because of an injury or other things, and you can actually see how that can impact your um, financial status and so forth. But we don't... Um, specifically address that as a uh, as a full topic here. Um, I, I am not aware of any games that deal with the issues of disabilities, but I do know that um, there are websites, for example, healthboards.com, that have a number of forums related to various um, health issues, including dis disabilities, um, that provide a space for people to come together and discuss issues. But I'm not aware of any games specifically. And, and Wendy, since since you're you're at the mic, let's let's continue. I've got a question about your research, um, and there's a question about whether or not your research focuses on the differentiation between whether the poor financial decision making is due to a lack of financial knowledge versus irrational behavior. So, for example, uh, how would you account for an individual who's aware that they need to save more for retirement, but they continue to en engage in non-savings um, behavior? Okay. You know, well Okay, well, the literature review, I think, does point um, very specifically to the, the notion that it's, it's about a lot more than just simply knowledge, that there's not necessarily a direct link between knowledge and skills and behavior. And the various um, behavior theories that we review in the paper offer a number of, um, I guess, um, views about why that might be so and what might be those other factors. And um, that may be why we have not seen the links that we have um, between financial education of various kinds and behavior is because we haven't looked at um, the variety of other factors very systematically in terms of the specific educational strategies. So there's a need for a whole lot more research there. Okay, and um, one more question for you, Wendy, while I've got you, um, that you mentioned having uh, the opt-out participation in retirement savings plan as an automatic feature rather than opt-in was an effective way to influence the adoption of uh, socially beneficial behavior. Did you see anything else in your research that was related to good practices for saving for retirement specifically? We, we, didn't look at, we didn't look at that specifically in the study, but rather we were focusing on the frameworks. And there are, you know, there's a whole body of literature coming out of behavioral economics that um, suggests that there are a variety of those kinds of strategies that are very useful in, um, um, in motivating behavior, positive behaviors. But we didn't look at that, that body of literature specifically. Okay. And I, I, I go ahead. Uh, Karen, it's Bruce. I just wanted to point out a, a resource that does speak to uh, some of the issues that you just mentioned there, and that is um, Finner has a website called retirementmadesimpler.org, which is a, a B2B website designed to help um, companies improve the savings rate uh, through automatic investment plans. We have a tremendous amount of research in our research library there, so if you're interested in that topic, you might want to go to re retirementmadesimpler.org. Great. Thanks for that resource, uh, Bruce. And uh, let me switch back to the games. I'm getting questions on the, on the research and the games. We've got lots of questions in queue. But there's one really about the viral uh, uh, potential of games in Facebook. So two quick questions that are related. One, uh, has any financial education games been spread by consumers virally? And then the second related question is, are there financial education games um, used by Facebook as a platform? That use Facebook as a platform. Uh, so, so uh, in terms of what the, what we've seen, we know there's a number of startup ventures looking at um, trying to use Facebook um, as a platform for gaming and so forth. So, I think you'll see stuff on that uh, in that 
space um, soon soon to come in terms of uh, stuff that's out there now. Um, there are all all of the major uh, Vill games from Zynga um, ha- basically have an economic system, and one question would be: Does playing those games build? Uh, does that build financial capability? In terms of games that go viral, um, the Games for Change folks know this quite well um, in in the game world. But um, the, the games that have that we've seen at least that go viral uh, are those that are around social issues. Um, Darfur is dying is a is a major example of that. Um, um, but in terms of uh, you know massive around the world viral, uh, that's uh, that's something that potentially uh, hasn't hasn't happened yet. Although what we've seen with our casual games is in each of our uh, tests, whether it's a large community college or you know a, a military base, uh, the games are easily spread uh, in those networks of students or of military personnel within unit uh, within uh, soldiers' families and so forth. And we've seen that now in five bases in the Army uh, and a number of community college settings. So it depends on what your scope of viral is, but in terms of the ones that have really <laughs> made it big, um, they tend to be um, social cause games uh, that raise awareness about some issue, not necessarily a, a learning game like, uh, like ours or, or Moneytopia. Um, that that would be f- that would be consistent with um, some of the literature that we ran into when we were uh, working on this project. There was a fascinating study by Berger and Milkman that was finished in 2009 on um, which articles and why are uh, people forwarded uh, from the New York Times, and they found that those articles that went viral that were forwarded more often were those that. Um, that were surprising or that created, um, were designed to create an emotional sort of connection with other people, so would be consistent with um, those studies that we looked at. And I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question because we've gotten a couple different questions that all really get to the the question about behavioral change and outcomes, and and, and is there any research that shows evidence of behavioral uh, changes? Another question uh, said that uh, we read a study that investors noted that they needed to save more than more for retirement. Yet, 12 late, months later, only a few percent said that they had actually done so. So, the question is, you know, Bruce, in, in your uh, presentation, you talked about 60 percent of individuals indicated that they will change their financial behaviors. But is there any way to actually track individuals to see if they do it? You, we have not done a follow-up study specific to Moneytopia at this point. Um, there is some information uh, related to uh, to that on the financial capability website that you may want to look at uh, to get an idea of how people are preparing for retirement and so and whether they're you know really embracing that need. And and Karen, I would note the study that I mentioned uh, earlier that the DDD will be um, releasing a white paper about in the late summer. But um, we're we're very interested in what all the questions that now come from this randomized experiment where. We had um, 200 low-income adults play farm blitz uh, for 30 to 45 minutes and then gave them steps to take action for savings, um, and savings being very difficult for financially vulnerable Americans, and that 4% take up among game players compared to 1% for traditional um, online-type financial education. So uh, that's what, exactly the type of research we want to do, and, and I also would say watch this space to see how this pilot project uh, works out with a, one of the largest employers out there and a large retirement services firm to see how um, Fight Club impacts real-world decisions uh, about uh, about uh, retirement deferrals and uh, retirement uh, uh, contribution. Great. Well, it, it feels like this webinar has just scratched the surface that there's more work being done and that at some point it might be a great opportunity to come back when we have results of, of some of these uh, these surveys and, and demonstrations, so that's really exciting. So I, I just want to um, see we're coming up against the end of our, our webinar period, so I do want to take an opportunity to thank Dr. Wei, uh, Bruce Faith, and Nick Maynard. I think their presentations have been uh, very useful, just judging by the questions and comments that have been generated, so I appreciate your time. want to let everybody know, if you are interested in getting the full copy of Dr. Wei's paper, the slides that have been used in the webinar, uh, you should be able to get, uh, go to the Center for Security, Financial Security's website by the end of the day today and download both of those. And then within a week, you can go back to the website and actually download an archive of this webinar if you're interested. If there's somebody that missed it that you might want to uh, uh, have them be able to listen to it, they could go back within a week and get the, an archived copy of the webinar. 
And lastly, I will just promote uh, the next webinar in this series is going to take place on Tuesday, August 16th at 1 o'clock Central, 2 o'clock Eastern Time. And that webinar is going to feature Christy Slack, where she's going to share her findings on integrating financial education into a traditional family support services. Uh, so I hope you all will be able to join us. Uh, again, if you want any of the resources, just continue to check back on the Center for, Fic- Center for Financial Security's website. Thank you very much.